And uh, we may do the final episode live on location from Avery Salvage. Yard. Oh shit, that's a great idea. <laughs> maybe we, maybe we got. Hey, we have a contact now. You think we can? Hey, go out do. there and set up, take a couple microphones. Well, yeah, we might be able to. That would and be I'm funny. Telling you, the dude, Avery will, sign behind us, that Salvage that would, Yard sign. That would be. Cool. That would be killer. That would be killer. That's funny. Oh said my god, killer. I can't believe I used that word. Put your hands together. The the and welcome to the stage. Big round of applause. The the All right, welcome back to the Smoke Screen Podcast, episode 58. Yes. And again, take two. Take two. Because we just tried this for 30 minutes and lost all our audio and video. Thank you. <laughs> But it was a good one. It really was. We were killing it. But I mean, at least we're laughing about it now because I was, oh my God. Yeah. Anyway, so we're back this week talking making a murderer. Yes. Slash convicting a murderer more specifically. Right. And um, I'm really excited because uh, before we get into that, you know, the next couple of episodes that we, we covered one through five in the first podcast a couple weeks ago, we, uh, we do have some exciting news. I'm so pumped. So next podcast, and this is 99.9%, like I said before, Mm -hmm. we have a special guest coming up related to convicting a murderer. So be sure to stay tuned for that. Uh, We'll let you know what's going on. Be sure to subscribe if you're on YouTube. And uh, we'll have somebody uh, very close to convicting a murderer on as a special guest. Yes, And um, can't wait for that one as well to get his insight. Me either. Into all this stuff. So anyway, a couple weeks ago, we... Brought back out Making a Murderer since Convicting a Murderer came out and talked about the first half of the season, episodes one through five, and um, all the big thing, all the big things we did not see in Making a Murderer. And this is really captivating people out there, bringing this all this stuff back up again. And I mentioned it before, just to mention it again, because I feel like I'm going to repeat myself everything yeah. we say. You know, we are talking about a true crime thing here. Teresa Hallback was the victim here. No matter what you believe, as far as the two That's sides, right. everything, the truthers and the guilters and the whole thing, yeah. we're trying to remain neutral. We don't want to be put in a box. We have questions about everything still, but this is definitely changing some things that um, we were deceived. We were. By making a murder. No doubt about it. Unfortunately, too. Yes. Because... Uh... I was a big fan of those those uh, filmmakers. Yeah, I, I was, and uh, now I'm seeing that, that it, it was a story to some degree, to mm-hmm. a lot of a big degree, I should say. Um, yeah, a lot of things edited, uh, changed. So, uh, I, real real quick too, I know this somehow gets political. There'll be a couple comments. Can't watch it. Daily Wire. Yes, we, we understand that. Look, if you're really interested in this case, do yourself a favor and watch this, regardless. To get the full, the full story, and again, you'll never know the full story. This case will never be solved to a T. There will never right. be a clean. Here's exactly what happened that night on the 31st of October, you know, 2005 or whatever. But it's these are just undisputable facts. It is, uh, and I, I think it needs to be explored. If yeah, if if you really got tied up in that making a murder or making a murder season two, yeah. Really, you know, were just um, found yourself binging them, cheering, you know, saying, "Give those guys another trial, or even free them." You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of people felt that way. Um, how you couldn't want to hear that potentially you were duped, right? And and yeah. see the see what people are talking about, you know, for yourself. That surprises me that I, I just separate yourself from, like you said, any anything political and right. just give it a shot because this was not made with any, it, it wasn't made by Daily Wire. No, I it mean, was acquired by Daily acquired. Wire. It's so a very important point to make. Candace Owens does host it. She inserts herself as kind of the host, but mm-hmm. she's not really in it a lot. She makes a few statements, gives her opinions. Yes. You can agree or disagree, but don't. Don't uh, uh, you know? Not watch it just because it comes from some source that you may not like or whatever. Which I don't understand any of this stuff. I I, I feel like if anybody with common sense should hear both sides of everything. Yeah. But this is not a political documentary. This is about a true crime that we were 
at least partially uh, deceived about from Netflix and making a murderer because they left out so much stuff. So, and if if you don't, I mean, we're going to try to at least highlight a lot of yeah. the things that they that they did on there. So, um, you know, we'll do our best. Yeah, but and we'll, like I said yourself. before in the, in the previous take, you know, I mean, we'll play devil's advocate on both sides. You know, a little what ifs, or whatever, and our opinions on things because. You know, it doesn't. So, in other words, it doesn't mean if I'm saying that this was definitely, uh, you know, you know, edited by uh, the creators of Making a Murder. It doesn't mean he's he's innocent. No, you that's know, right. It's just, it's just we're going to go through everything we possibly can. Obviously, not every little single thing, but like you mentioned before, mm -hmm. say that again. If as far as the people who may comment, you can't change my mind. We already knew all this stuff. Yes, yeah, it's just I see those comments. Yeah, and and they're like. Uh, big deal. We already knew he was a bad guy. Um, that that's not this this uh, series isn't showing us anything new. That tells me, yeah, you've only seen episode one. You've only seen the free episode the on, on on YouTube, YouTube or Twitter free. or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Because we we did say that we said that before yeah. watching convicting a murderer. There's nothing you can tell me that's going to change my mind about this. We know he's a bad guy. We said it in our podcast two years ago. We said it last week in our podcast. Yes. Anybody that throws a, an animal on a fire, or whether you're trying to miss the fire, you're an asshole. You're you're a bad right. person. Um, but we're talking about a separate murder case here. We are. So you just you know at least be. Uh, we're just you know we're trying to remain neutral but open minded to both sides. There's still questions all around. Mm -hmm. But if you don't want to see this or don't want to accept some of the things just because you think that the convicting of murder people are tearing their own narrative, because that's what I keep seeing. I've watched some other videos. I have to. Trying to stay abreast and fair yeah. and listen to all sides. And that's what they'll say. It's the main kind of uh, um, theme in these videos is we already knew this stuff. We knew he's a bad person. They're just It's just a character assassination yeah, or a revelation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make him a murderer. No, it doesn't. Right. But um, a lot more is in it than that. Even during episode one of Convicting a Murderer, yeah. you and I were saying, damn, that is bad. That yeah. is bad. But yeah. but it doesn't, this is nothing new. This isn't groundbreaking no. to me. We get to the evidence. Get yes. To the evidence. That's what well, we kept saying. We're getting to the evidence. We are. And so, it hits hard. It does. So the last uh, ep podcast, or two weeks ago, whatever, we did kind of a mid season review, episodes one through five, went through some of that stuff. Uh, so check that one out because we're going through like all the, the, the big things in some detail uh, as far as, you know, what was cut out, what was missed and what the full story is when you kind of combine these two together mm -hmm. as, a, as a full narrative. Yeah. And again, we'll never get the perfect, clear, crystal clear vision of what happened that night. Um, so that's just not going to happen. And, and only the murderer, whoever that is, and God, That's if you right. believe in God or any of that stuff, knows. Uh, so hopefully, but hopefully the uh, the full truth will come to light to some degree. Yes. But anyway, uh, anything else before we jump back in again <laughs> to <laughs> episodes six and seven? Um, I don't know. Did we just mention we did? Um, you know, full disclosure, mm -hmm. we did receive screeners. Oh yes. for the full season. We cannot yes. talk about anything that's not been public yet. And which goes into again our, our special guest coming up and uh, hopefully next week. Uh, I'm really excited about that. So we have seen beyond episode seven, but we we're not going to spoil right. anything. Leave it for you guys to make a make, make up your own minds that type of thing. So we're going over basically episode six and seven since we did like one through five. Full disclosure. Yeah, <laughs> I've watched beyond episode seven yeah. twice yeah. now. <laughs> there you go. I have not. <laughs> I have not. But we definitely will. Um, and uh, we'll definitely be talking about this even after next week's. We'll, I'm sure we'll wrap this up after the finale. Maybe I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. I'm how, sure how, we will. We might have a couple more. Yeah, we really might. Because yeah, this is a pretty big thing right now, and uh, there's so, just so much stuff you can't sit down in one podcast and have a five hour long discussion about yeah. about every little thing. And uh, we may do the final episode. Live on location from Avery Salvage. Yard. Oh shit, that's a great idea. <laughs> maybe we, maybe we got. Hey, we have a contact now. You think we can? Hey, go out do. there and set up, take a couple microphones. Well, yeah, we might be able to. That would and be I'm funny. Telling you, the dude, Avery will, sign behind us, that Salvage that would, Yard sign. That would be cool. that would be killer. That would be killer. That's funny. Oh said my god, killer. I can't believe I used that word. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, that's just <laughs> see. 
Oh, my God. Maybe this will be the better than the first day. Maybe it will. Okay. Anyway, let's jump right in. So, um, yeah, again, real quick, thank you guys for the recent support. It's cool having a podcast come back every week. It's you know doing it pretty is. well. It's definitely fun to do. We really enjoy these, um, and we're doing a lot of cool shorts now they are out there. So, uh, uh, help us out. Give us a you know a rating on whatever podcast platform, and definitely subscribe on YouTube and all that good stuff. That's something, too, that I haven't, I haven't really told you since we've been doing these again, it's like it helps my midweek grind at work. Yeah. Yeah. When you, yeah. when you release these, I get really excited. Right. It, I'm, I mean, it comes right in the middle, middle of the week, you know, I get to. Kinda yeah. And then we're, we get to read comments, ear pods on. Yeah. All that stuff as they pile up throughout the week, yeah, at least man. for, you know, last episode wasn't topical, so it's more yeah. of a you know Q and A fun thing. But it's hard to title that type of thing. So, um, but this is definitely one of those things that's a lot of people are following right now. And I and I have seen, to be fair, a lot of comments saying, "Yeah, I was duped." So there are people saying that, but there's still a lot of people in the so-called truther camp that just refuse to listen to any of this. And then there's other people who always thought it, you know it was trash. I mean, so. We're just trying to be like, you know, uh, listen to both sides fair and in the middle and just go over the stuff and not trying to change anybody's mind. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll give you our opinions for, for sure, but uh, it's a lot, so much stuff, man. If, if so you're much stuff in this case. a person who doesn't like the police. Yes. Yeah. Who you said that. Wouldn't yeah. believe a word that came out of a cop's mouth, no matter what they're talking about, then. Some of the things we're going to talk about just aren't for you anyway. But, but sure. if you're open-minded and you want to uh, hear some of the the other side a little bit on some of those gotcha moments in making a murderer, right? We 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 really recommend watching it, but we're going to try to explain some of it to you. Yeah, or, or, you know. Yeah. Shed so light again, on. don't 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 do yourself a disservice and and not watch this because it's from some organization you don't like or whatever. You know, it's just really if you're interested in this case, um, you know you'll want to hear this. Trust me. Because we were we were just like everybody else. Yeah. When, when we watched 100%. it, we were pissed. He was framed. One hundred. He absolutely deserved another trial. Absolutely. In my mind. Brandon Dassey had nothing to do with nothing. Yeah. All that stuff. I could not imagine how two juries got something so wrong. Yes. I just, I, I was blown Ken away. Kratz is the devil. Yes. He may still be the devil he to may. some degree. But yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely, you know, the cops, Colburn especially. Yes. Uh, which, you know, to get straight into episode six, that's yeah. what it opens up with. It's Colburn. Colburn. Yeah. So Colburn kind of coming off episode five where... You know, he is now the bad guy. He's one of the villains of this story for, for sure. Him and, and Detective Link, I think mm -hmm. it is, uh, along with Fassbender and all the rest of the cops. He They start by showing all the death threats he started getting. I mean, just how many, 20, was it like 24 hours full of recorded conversations? Yeah. Over to, 24 hours. To his said. house and to his you know office in the, the police department. I mean, from all over the world. And they said mostly it actually was international. You know, yeah. I mean, literal threats of, you know, I'll be waiting outside your house, like you said, with a the, with the rifle. I hope yes. you do this in front of your kids, do these horrible things. Yeah, terrible. Yeah, things. horrible. So um, we were, I was, you know, we said we were watching some other videos and, and whatever, and the director, uh, Sean, said that that was part of his motivation was, uh, you know, there's real people here involved in this. And the wake that that left left people in in real danger, honestly, and including really you know, Colburn. So they used him as the biggest example because, of course, he's the one who called in the license plate, and we'll get to that, of course. But Think about this, um, Chris. When in Making a Murderer, there's a lot of clips of people from around, I guess maybe the world, but definitely around the United States, who have traveled there, stand outside yes. on the courthouse steps, yes, picketing, you know, yelling at passing cars. What's to say some lunatic wouldn't travel that far to do bad things? 100%. If I was it's them, a, I would a, really be worried. It's a fact. 
And that's the thing, man. You know, you got to remember everybody's human. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you watch this thing and you came away, yeah, he's 100% these dirty cops. They deserve whatever. You know, you know hold on. <laughs> that's what this is for. This is to kind of show the other side of things. So um, really, really. Uh, and, of course, you know, again, they're playing the all the calls. And, you know, he's mm-hmm. talking about how it affected him and his family. And then I mean, you start to empathize a little bit with him as a, as a person and not this stone-cold Cop killer, you know, cop who's a killer. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to say who helped frame this innocent man twice and all this kind of stuff. So we talked about in the last podcast, you know, he had nothing to do with the previous case. He was not liable in that lawsuit like they right. made it out to be. So anyway, regardless what you think, um, as far as, you know, the key and all that kind of stuff, he just had nothing to do with the first case. And it's just a fact. There's no, you know, that's right, really. So uh, if I can read my notes that I had scribbled through before. <laughs> But the license plate call was the big thing. Yes. So he calls in this license it's plate. It's huge. It was the big gotcha moment, one of a minute. Yes. Big gotcha moment. Huge. Like you said, it was episode one. Episode one. Where he, um, no. Yeah, no. The no. Episode one. One was, was the other yeah. thing we were talking about the other thing. Do we have Stephen Avery in custody? In custody. <laughs> yeah. That and was I the wanted big to bring one. that up because we yeah. did fail to mention that yeah. on the last one. So is it cool to cover that now? Go, or, go for we, it. Um, because that bothered me that we we forgot to mention that in our yeah. last There's podcast. There's always that, oh, shit, we forgot this yeah. in the podcast. Right. Um, so in episode one of Making a Murder, it ends with this cliffhanger where you hear um, someone talking to dispatch and said, so we ha- do we have Stephen Avery in custody? And right. you're like, why in the hell would he ask that? Why would he ask if we have Stephen Avery in custody? Yeah. What you find out is... During the course of this investigation, they had police out around the property and everybody seen the aerial views, all these roads going right. around this place. So they were stopping traffic. They had the road blocked and they were stopping traffic of all the cars coming through and checking people's ID and, and checking them out. Yeah, because you had locals had to go in and they mm-hmm. lived there in those, in those areas. And know. so... What they found was when they ran somebody's ID, there was a hit on it, and it came back with uh, there was a warrant, like a be on the lookout warrant or something. Um, and so they, because there was that warrant, they had to take this person into custody. Right. So that went out over the radio that they were taking somebody into custody. Um, and whoever that was on the episode one that called in. He right. knew that they were out there searching the salvage yard. At, at the Avery's place specifically. Yes, yep. at the Avery's place. And um, they also knew that Stephen was uh, who they were looking at because he was the last person that saw her. Right. When he heard that somebody was taken into custody, I mean, that's all he heard. So when he was talking to them, he said, so do we have Stephen, a- do they have Stephen Avery in custody? If they would have played a little bit longer, yes. she would have said, no, it was this and that. And he would have been like, oh, okay, I just heard somebody got arrested over there. Right. Like, he literally says this, but they don't but, play it long they, enough. They just stop it. Right. Stop the tape. So I thought that was a huge part. And that was a big hook for episode one of it Making was. Murder. Because it went off with that. And it's like, oh, shit, they're after this dude again. Mm-hmm. He just got out of prison. What the hell? And that was a And once you're, and that's what, like we said before, that's what can kind of conditions you for everything else, all this kind of setup. It does. To, uh, you know, this horrible big conspiracy. Yeah, they keep putting more layers on this onion. Yes. You know? And you're just getting wrapped up, and it's emotional, and the music and all the editing we'll talk about as well. But but Colburn, going back to him, obviously the big license plate call. It was so huge. as everybody knows, he calls in two or three days before the car is actually found. He calls in the dispatch and run this tag for me, reads off the tag number, and the dispatcher says, yep, that uh, belongs to Teresa Hallback, all that stuff. And then he says, okay, 1990-whatever Toyota. Yep. Knew the make and model of the car. Mm-hmm. And obviously that was the big gotcha moment in the trial where he says, were you standing behind that car when you called in? And he's like, no. Yeah, it got me. I was like, yeah. why in the hell would he call that How in if he, he was know? not looking right at it? But if you really think about it, and this is – very simple explanation. It was still a missing person at this point. There was no murder. There was no, you know, nobody arrested. Mm-hmm. And they already knew all that information. And so what had happened was as they're investigating all this and they're going to places that Teresa had been that day, a detective had called him 
and told him, this is what we're looking for. This is the car. This is the make and model in the tag. Here's what, here's the missing car. Yeah. This is the missing person we're looking for. And so he said he takes this call, and he's driving. So, and you can kind of picture you're on the phone right here, and you're driving like this, and you're trying to write down something. And that's what he said he was happening, and he didn't immediately pull that's, over. That's the BOL thing. To be on the lookout was for the car. And I said it was like a be on the lookout warrant oh, on that yeah, other yeah, thing. Yeah. No, that's what yeah. it was. Because I, I I heard that phrase. He was like, it was a BOL, and uh, it was a be on the lookout for that car. Right. That guy told right. him told him all to look for that. So think about that. I'm sorry, reenact that again. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> yes. You know, you're driving. You're driving. You the phone. He's the, telling you this stuff. You know, you're writing with this hand. you got the hand on the wheel. I'm, I'm trying to get around the mic here. But he's scribbling this down in his lap is what he's basically saying. So yes. then uh, what happens is he goes over to the Zipper residence. Now, the Zippers is the other people that Teresa went to that day to take pictures of, mm -hmm. of, for Auto Trader Magazine. So he pulls in this church parking lot across from the Zipper residence waiting on these other cops to come to go, to go speak to these people mm -hmm. about Teresa's disappearance. And that's where he calls in dispatch to verify that this is what he wrote down because he wasn't sure exactly with his scribbling yeah, while driving. While driving. And then, so for years, nobody knew when this was. They all said it was on the fourth his day off. Mm -hmm. And then they said, you know, what'd you do on your day off? And he was like, I, I went and checked on my mother-in-law, which I did every day. I went into town, ran some errands, I think. And then me and my wife you know, ate dinner and stayed home all night, whatever. No big deal. But he... But he couldn't remember exactly all the details of the mundane cop day at right. work. You know, it's like, well, you do remember your days off and the good times. You don't remember mundane work days. Yeah. Every little detail. They all bleed together. They do. So the point being that nobody knew exactly what day this came in, even during the trial. Nope. No timestamps on the calls. They got the call logs, but they were just in chronological order. No timestamps mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. Well, a guy named Rookie, who you'll see throughout this documentary, who is a truther, who believes Stephen Avery is innocent, mm -hmm. they were all set up, actually got this information years and years later. They got sent from Manitowoc County to him, I guess, from some records act or 14 whatever. 14 years later. 14 years. That's a long time. It is. That's how long it took. And this is took. how long it took. You know, People thought that this cop called in on his day off for this big setup, and he knew the car because he's already you know, had found it or it was you know, platinum or whatever. Well... Turns out it was on the second. Was that right? The third. Second, I'm sorry, the third mm -hmm. at eight twenty something p.m. Or I believe that's right. Somewhere I know it's eight something p.m. And that puts him exactly where he said he was in this church parking lot at the Zipper residence because that is confirmed to be where they talked to. You know, that's on the record. Right. This is an indisputable fact. He was at this church, at this residence, because then after that they go speak to these people at this time. Yes. Now, another huge thing about that was that he called in on a cell phone. Yeah, another and big not but, but why radio? not the radio? Why not the radio? Right. I mean, well, he says, look, she's a missing person. We know that people have scanners. What if she's being kidnapped and the person who's holding her has a scanner and they're like, oh, God, they're, you yeah. know, this and that? They don't know the cops know anything at this point. Right. So he said, and, and just to keep it quiet in general, I mean, it makes sense to call over the phone to check his scribbling, like he said. Yep. And uh, thank goodness that it was logged like that, and they found out after all these years now, because that was such a huge thing that I've brought up to you in conversation and to it anybody that will listen. It's like, he saw that damn car. I yeah, know he, he did. knew the make and model. He had to be standing behind it. And oops, it slipped up. And the way they edited everything was, uh, you know, he was all nervous on the stand when asking this question. If you're open-minded, you have to say it's as likely to be what they're saying in this documentary. Yes, as Correct. he's looking at it and calling it in and seeing it before it ever shows up on the salvage yard. Exactly. A hundred percent. And to top that off, that's just, that's just documented fact. Now, as far as I'm concerned, to top it off, the way they edited the trial footage was really deceiving. So these filmmakers, yes. you know, I don't know if they'll be doing any interviews anytime soon. Honestly, I can't imagine. Um, because they took this when he's specifically Stephen's lawyer says, were you standing behind that vehicle when you called in? And he says, no, or whatever. Mm -hmm. They took his answer 
uh, oh, it says you, you, you think that would look suspicious. Yeah. And he's like, yes. But the truth is, is he never answered that question. He did not. The, the, the Kratz, being the prosecution, objected, and the, jur- uh, the judge agreed. So he never actually answered that question. Mm-mm. The very next question was almost the opposite. Yeah. And he answered yes, and they put that into the edit. Yeah. What he answered yes to was, so when you called this in, this was just like any of the other licenses you've called in over the years yeah, or just whatever. just like every other one. Every other like, one. Yes. Yes. And on top of that, this one little, you, everybody made a big deal of the body, like you said, the body language people. Yes. You know, made a big deal of how he kind of was crossing his hand. He kind of leaned back like yeah. he was nervous Looked about nervous. this question. Well, turns out that that was just when he was waiting to be questioned. That wasn't even during that question. No. That was like when he's just like up there, there he's waiting for somebody to approach him or an attorney to get up and start asking questions. They used that shot three times. Yeah, now think about that. Three times. Three times. Not just uh, they didn't let the natural trial play out. I'm obviously not gonna cut, you know, leave in just dead space where he's just sitting there. But they used that specific dead space to make him look like he was nervous about being asked that question. Yeah. So if they if they showed it three times, they knew that that yeah. shot made him look a certain way. Yes. So they are really trying hard to deceive you by using it over and over again. And and to make him look bad, like you said. Yeah. They even Netflix. They told him, you know, when you show the cops, play this ominous music. Yeah, we may not have mentioned that in this. This is just take two. Um, right. Yeah, we found that out from other interviews that um, from Sean Reck, who's the director, mm-hmm. is uh, when Netflix took this, they actually made them. Again, they didn't produce it themselves, but they actually made them make it worse. Yeah. As far as like play more ominous music when you're showing the cops and all this kind of stuff. So they mm. use these, you know, uh, storytelling methods to tell this narrative that they wanted to tell. And then just a, real quick, when they mentioned, when Brendan got involved, they made a phone call to Stephen Avery and said, Hey, look, we're, we're still with you all the way. Yes. That's a little, it's a little weird. If you, if you're just trying to tell a documentary, Yep. Because the documentary is a documentary. It's about truth and, and facts and both sides, every side. And after it came out and they were being interviewed by everybody and and they're even asked, hey, you know, why did you leave this out or whatever? I didn't like that one of them said, we make documentaries, so we're storytellers. Right. No, I'm like, no, if you're a documentarian – you should be a truth teller. That's right. the way I feel. Right. And that, or that say may involve up front. some storytelling, sure. I yeah. mean, there is certainly nobody's denying but, to but make I it more think, entertaining. I feel like the storytelling when you're a documentary maker is more with the way you shoot things yes. and, and organize them. Yes, exactly. Not but like not cutting fabricate out test, yeah, exactly. things, you know, to make a story. Not cutting evidence out and in and, and certain words and, and, and lines that are missing from this whole dialogue and yeah. rearranging them. That's not, you know, documentation. And when you see this, I know we talked about it on the last one, but when you see the split screen and they show this this yeah. side is what was on making a murderer. This is the court uh, document that shows what was really said. Yeah. You're going to be shocked. I think you should, it, you should be shocked. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 at least at that particular aspect, I mean, they literally show you side by side what was shown in making a murder. And then the actual either footage of the, of the trial. True. Yeah. Uh, you know, the full conversation or right. the, or the actual transcript, transcript yeah. and how they just skip the whole paragraph or two or make this mosaic of it. Almost. Yeah. Sometimes they'll snip here, put here and really, really odd. Things. So that's not like you said, a documentary and that's a storyteller. That's, that's a story. That's a narrative. And again, I know people will say, but they're telling their narrative. Yeah, I, yeah, we're not saying that they're right. not telling another side, but it, it is another side. It's kind of different when it's a reaction to it really a is documentary. Different. You can't just say yeah. it's their own little narrative. I mean, it's it's there's factual stuff here. Yes, it's not just. Uh, and yeah, I'm not saying they don't shoot it entertaining and rearrange things or whatever. I'm not. We're not talking about that. But clearly, it's a little different when it's a it's a rebuttal series. It is because more and more or less, what they're doing is saying. 
hey, remember this thing that pissed you off? Yes. This is really what happened. Right. There's uh, not I, much of a narrative going on there. Right, exactly. Um, so then the other thing, I think, in episode uh, six, the, the another big aspect that was left completely out of making a murder was the burn barrel and not yes. barbs because they mentioned barbs, mm-hmm. and they did find some bigger bone fragments in there. But... Stephen's personal burn barrel. They never brought up whatsoever. So he he did have a burn barrel on his property. And I don't think that's a big surprise. We got another cat hole over here uh, mm-hmm. trying to uh, tear shit up. Um, but the big yeah, thing... Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think it's a big surprise. No, but... no, not at all. But when they asked him, have you burned any fires out there? And he says, no, not in about two weeks. Okay, no big deal. But then it come, turned, comes to find out that Earl his brother Earl, and his friend, and I have his name written here that I scribbled out, but it's Bob. Mm-hmm. Bob uh, Fabian, I believe it is. I think you are right. So they come up that day, this day, the 31st, and they're on a golf cart coming up to Stephen's trailer, and they saw the burn barrel in his yard smoking. Mm-hmm. Now, he has a little detail that smelled like plastic, but the way they know this is yeah. because the smoke was in his face, and he asked Earl to pull the golf cart up a little further. Right. So, so that's something that would stick out in your mind. Yeah. Right? Yeah, sure. And and Stephen basically over and over again said nothing was burnt. He he didn't burn anything. No. And so you could say, well, they're on the same property. Somebody whoever's framing him, right, could put the stuff in Stephen's burn barrel. But isn't it odd that he's saying nothing burnt in there? Like, everybody knows Stephen's burn barrel burnt, but Stephen, bullcrap. Right. And then the thing about the fires in general, remember, there was no bonfire brought up at all until Barb and Stephen's conversation. Oh, yeah. And he's like, there had no fire. And then, yes, you did that night. What night? The night I went to visit... You know, yeah. Scott's mom in the hospital, which was the 31st. We had established that already. I and saw the fire. It's weird. He said, well, Brendan would have been with me. Yeah, and then Brendan was with me all of a sudden. So yeah. then it changed again to, oh, yeah, yeah. I had a bonfire, and then I invited Brendan over. Mm-hmm. So we established in the first podcast, you know, his story definitely changed. You know, he told his brother, photographer never showed up. And then it was, oh, yeah, she came, but I just saw her out the window. And then it was... The the, you know, the the current version, if you will, of, you know, yeah, she came, took pictures. I walked out. She paid me. She handed me the Alder Trader magazine. Yeah. So this is the second big instance of no fires. I hadn't burned anything in a couple of weeks. Maybe Jody did mm-hmm. before she went. She was in jail that night. Right. Um, but then two different people, including, I think, Brendan's brother also went, testified he saw the burn barrel as well. And there, as far as the filmmakers... Again, yes, they mentioned that her camera and stuff, her electronics were found in a burn barrel. Yes. But it was always, to me, it felt like they were behind Barb's house. That's 100% what I thought because they never mentioned his burn barrel. They just mentioned they found the burn barrel, including that stuff, but Barb's, that's where everything was back there, away from his house. Mm -hmm. And so that's the big next obvious thing is this is where her actual camera, cell phone, and PDA were found. And again, they took those remains, rain, remaining parts, the, the metallic stuff, all that, matched it up to the boxes and all that, confirmed that was her stuff in his burn barrel that he did not have a fire for that day. Right. But actually did. So that's pretty pretty overwhelming evidence right there to lie about just having fires. I mean, you're in an auto salvage yard. I'm sure they burn shit all the time. And it's yeah. not a big deal to have a fire out there almost all it's the time. It's not. But to you, you kind of put yourself in a corner when you told the investigator on the phone, and I, we they played this conversation. Yeah. Uh, no, I hadn't been about two weeks, and I just burned garbage. You know, I'm sure he does burn trash out there. Yeah. But he definitely had a fire that day. Yeah. Why? I, that's that's another thing against him, and and you know I am one of the people who I really believed that he at 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 least should get a new trial. Yeah, at the, at the very minimum, he um, he did not. It did not happen the way they presented it. New trial, and let's go over all this stuff. You know, Brendan obviously he's false confession, all that kind of stuff as well. But the fact that 
he was directly asked multiple times, did you burn anything? And he says no. Okay, what what would he lie for? for? Uh, again, you you know these people burn their trash. Mm-hmm. So he could have said, yeah, some trash or something, you know. Yeah. Any, you know said I do it all the time. Why? Yeah, why? Uh, he knew him and Brendan had a bonfire. That is clear. The things Brendan named, um, we got some, we went around and got some tires and a, a couch, couch or something. Yep. And it, like you can clearly see, yes, okay, there's some rims. There's some springs from a couch, an old friend, you know what I mean? So the steel belting from the tires. Yeah, it's clear that 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 happened. Why, if you're Steven, why would you deny or lie? Why would you just Uh, straight up say, yeah, we had a bonfire on Halloween after she took the pictures and left. Yeah. We had, we cleared up some stuff, burn it. Why did he wait till after? To exactly. start going, oh, yeah, yeah, we rounded up some stuff exactly. and burned it. Because, like I said, I mean, this is a property where everybody lives. Everybody can see each other out windows if they look or they yeah. come out. They go to each other's houses all the time and just walk in. They're family, for, for Christ's sake. I mean, it shouldn't have been a big deal, but the fire never even came up until Brendan came into the picture about any fires, much less the burn barrel that was just completely left out of making a murderer. So they would have you believe that, you know, again, the way they presented it is these items were found in Barb's burn barrel behind her house near the fire pit where mm-hmm. supposedly she was uh, burned. All right. So next we had in this episode was the big, you know, another aha moment, the key, the infamous key that just magically appeared. Yes. <laughs> so That was a huge thing in the documentary. Very big, murder. very big. So, you know, the key was, the place was searched seven times and never found anything. Then all of a sudden magically a, p- a key appears in the seventh search. Uh, first of all, I think we mentioned in the last podcast. It was technically only two searches. The rest of the five were what they call targeted searches. So that's where, hey, go in and get the gun. Go in and get this or that or the, the porn. porn stash. Yes. So not like we're picturing where they go in and flip everything over and search detailed right. and somehow miss that key. So the key is a big thing. Obviously, you know, it's 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 her key, it fits her car. Uh it's got her his blood on it, his DNA, but not hers, which is still very odd to me. Yeah. And I think me too. you agree. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and what they didn't show in making a murder is exactly how these searches took place and how it magically uh, an, at least a possibility on how this key just kind of fell out of this bookshelf magically was there's a back it yes. was actually kind of peeled open. So if you picture, you know, everybody's put together some piece of furniture, little bookshelf, whatever, you turn it around and you you tack on the back little pieces, whether it's a wood panel or cardboard, this right. looked to be wood. That was actually loose. Yeah. All and the way down. Conveniently on making a murderer, they show angles of this thing yeah. where they don't show the bottom where the back is open about an inch. They might show that side, but they never show the bottom of right. it. Right. They never kind of pan down to the no. whole thing. And, I mean, you can clearly see. These are photographs taken as evidence mm-hmm. that they could have easily put on the screen the full picture where they're showing, hey, this thing's open at the bottom. So if a key was in the back, and actually the way, um, uh, what's his name? Colburn. Colburn yep. described it is, look, I was tired of dealing with Steven's porn. So they sent us out there to get some porn and we're searching where, where would porn be? Oh, here's some papers and some notebooks and stuff down here. Right. He opens up this three ring binder, looks nothing in there, slams it. He's like, I'm kind of aggravated. So I admit I do slam it. He said, I'm not saying I knocked the back out on it, right? but um, I did slam it in there pretty hard. The back was open. So let's say there was a key at the very back. Right. Maybe, like Chris has said before, it could have been kind of pinched in there from maybe previous searches or whatever. But somehow, when they pushed it, now that you know that there's an inch wide opening on the back, yes, it's easy to go, hmm, 
a key could fall out of that thing. Yes, it at least gives the possibility where before yes. it was just like a magical thing where it fell out from behind the wall. Yeah. You know, there was no they, holes in the wall. No. No and secrets. They made it seem magical, yeah. Yeah, they really did. And and so now at least, you know, again, there's no clear-cut answer for the key. No, there's Because not. they even said to them, you know, on this documentary, mm-hmm. you know, you know, he leaned over and said, Hey, there's a key on the floor, and everybody was surprised to see it because they had been start they had just searched that and it wasn't there. But now if you know that there's this opening and there's they're they're shoving things back in there, you know, he said pretty forcefully, yeah, then you know there's at least a possibility that there was a key in there that fell out. Right. And they had moved it and tilted it, and people were talking about the quarters on top where they should have been gone or moved, and they were yeah. different. So you don't, you know, but the way they described it is, you know, I think Colburn, you know, he kind of tilted it out and turned it and whatever. But I don't, I don't remember him saying he like shook it hard or anything like that. And that even, wouldn't make any sense. But moving it around, you know, for sure. And even Kratz said he was puzzled by it, yeah. by the change being on the top and not disturbed. He's like, hey, I don't know how that makes sense either. Right. But I didn't need the key. Didn't it need pissed him off that he found it, that it, they found because it. Because of the Manitowoc County yeah. officers, which is, that was the, public perception, which is why they made you think in making a murder, they wouldn't allow it out there when, in fact, that was Manitowoc County DA. That was his decision yeah. is to have somebody with them just to cover their asses. Yeah. But they were not – they were allowed. Yeah, they were allowed. They they had said they were going to try to rec- recuse themselves or whatever. Yeah, but correct. Unfortunately, um, the other county I just named earlier um, – Calumet. No. Cal- Calumet County – just didn't have the resources. No, small these are town. very small towns. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think they gave the impression in making a murder. This, I said this last podcast that you kept showing the kind of the nice courthouse and mm-hmm. and all that, and you're like, you know, this, for some reason you got you pictured this big sheriff's department, right? And you're tra- you're probably talking about what fifteen traffic cops or something at the most, right? And I mean, they literally called in the state patrol, state troopers for security around the place. They called in firemen and people just to search cars. It was such yeah. a big, you know, you got 40 acres. That's giant as for a crime scene. And if those guys found any evidence, they weren't trained on how to handle it as well. Right. So they had to have these officers from Manitowoc County. Who were trained evidence gatherers, and that's why they sent them in there specifically. So if you're going to frame this guy, from a county that he's suing at the at the moment, there's a lawsuit going on from his previous conviction, who was where he was, you know, legitimately legitimately convicted of something he did not commit. Why send those guys? Right. Why did they? Why send them in there if you're going to plant a key? You that's know, just right. just have one of your own go in there and find a key. Yeah, that 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 would be that's that's. Really dumb. It, it really honestly. is. I mean, so if you think about it, just if you take a step back from this whole thing and, and the emotion of it, yeah, and you remove the key, if you can imagine that didn't even exist in making a murder, you don't need the key. You really don't. And I, I, I mean, look, I'm agreeing with the crats. I never thought I'd say that, but you do not need this key. You have a car, yes, on his property with his blood in it, yeah, and her blood in it. So Why do you what? need a key? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> now. I did say something about uh, they were trained evidence handlers and everything. Still, dis- you know, I still have problems with the way they handled some of the evidence. Yes. As they do. And yes. they admit if we had to do it over again, definitely would have yeah, done a better just, job at do some, some of things these things. differently. Yeah. I think. Yep. So don't, don't think I'm just, you know, totally, oh, they said they had, you know, they were trained evidence handlers. You know, I'm not. I'm not saying they didn't make mistakes. They yeah. they absolutely did. Yeah, and I think it was still a strong point. The last uh, t- uh, podcast we mentioned, you know, if they were going to plant something, they never knew they were going back in there. Why not do it the first time that, yeah. that they went in there? I mean, really. Yeah, I mean, they they didn't know they were going back. They didn't, you know, he sent other teams in there between those visits. So, you know, plant it and let the other team find it. That's, and, that's what I would do. It. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> it makes sense to me. But the key is a big, obviously a big thing. And again, there's still going to be arguments about the key. It's never going to be clear because they admit themselves it's very odd on how it was, you know, they looked at this thing and then there was no key and then all of a sudden there was a key when they turned around and two different, you know, three people missed it until just he happened to look down and there it is. So, again, no clear-cut thing. And this whole case will never be clear-cut. We'll never no, know exactly what never. happened in this case. Um, I think um, 
the next little part of this episode to wrap up this episode was basically the blood evidence. You know, the the car, the the you know, they they had to plant the oh, blood yes. because you have a he's got a cut on his right hand. They showed that cut many, many times and you know, but it was it was healing up, so it couldn't have been dripping all over the place and and you and you agree when you see especially season two, Kathleen Zellner test all this stuff. Yeah. You can't crank the car with that right hand and get blood in that little recessed area. You can't, can't happen. It can't happen. Physics is physics. I said before we started watching it. Don't matter what they say, physics is physics. Yeah. But they didn't show us how the car was parked. And that really, when I saw that picture, <laughs> I know. that pissed me off. I know. Because you, you're still... It's like a foot between. It's like a foot between. That car and the car beside it on the driver's side. On the driver's side. So Kratz actually brings up in the discussion with um, Rookie, the truther who's in, you know, throughout this documentary... And he says, this is what the experts say. He reached in from the passenger side, and he's got this little cut, right? Mm -hmm. And he reaches over to get the keys because he, whatever reason, he, and why do you need the key? Why are you going to take it out of your house? Yeah. But for whatever reason, he wants the key, so he reaches back in, drip across the passenger seat, another drip right there at the passenger seat as well. I think a third is kind of in the cons on the edge of the console. Yeah, the one on the door frame. The passenger door jam, that one always perplexed me. Yeah, why if Stevens driving it, is there anything is there on any the door, on the door jam on the passenger but side? That really explains it. <laughs> it explains the path all the way to the key yes. ignition that where you would put the key in. So if you're reaching in across, reaching in, bending over, mm -hmm. drip, 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 key, pulled it out. Then you got the little door jam on the back, you know, the back door on that side. And then her CD case. We can only assume yeah. that Stephen would probably do it at night. I mean, yeah, there, I mean, I, I don't think he's driving at Rab Four around there during the day. No, he's so, got family there. Yes, and they're looking for that car, you know. So I, I just said they're looking for the car. I, I don't know when the car was parked there. Um, so it, it might have been parked there before anybody knew they should have been looking, but they all knew she was missing. At that point, right? Yeah, I would imagine the car as was soon parked as, like, there that night. The next yeah. day, I would say people would have been looking for it. So let's say it was parked there that night. So his family wouldn't have been looking for it. But I'm just yeah. saying, I don't think he would have drove it in the daytime. So right. now, picture that. He's probably, um, he had to crawl out the passenger side. If he got out the driver's side when he got out, he squeezed and squeezed to get out of there. Yeah, he when sucked you see his gut in and squeezed. I mean, so hard. <laughs> so he, he, he's probably walking away and goes, damn, let me get the key. And he reaches in. But that explains, because his right hand is cut on his middle finger. Yeah. As uh, Zellner tried to show when he's trying to crank it, that's what Kratz is like. No, he's not cranked. Don't think about the cranking. He reaches back in, grabs it. You right. could easily see how he could get in that recessed spot. Yeah, there. from that position, that angle from the mm -hmm. passenger side, and it shows almost a path to the blood. It does. Know, to the key, yeah. or to the ignition. Yeah. And another big, huge thing, he had a Grand Am. This that, is huge, man. That he drove personally. A blue Grand Am. Yeah. Never and saw this in making a murder. Never. And it was in the trial, brought up in the trial. And he admitted to bleeding in it. And yep. guess what? The blood looks eerily similar because I've heard so many people say, well, nobody would bleed oh, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit right. there, six inches here. And if he's actively bleeding, it would be all over the place. No, his car looked really similar <laughs> to her car. I mean, they didn't even mention his car in making a murder. They no. didn't show his car. Mm -mm. They didn't say that it was impounded by the police with blood in it. And they, he admitted he bleed, bled in his car. That's right. And I think the the I think what's confusing is the term active bleeder. Yeah. An active bleeder, you're thinking of like drip, 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 or whatever. Right. But everybody's had that cut that you smack and it gets busted back open or whatever, mm. and it's like a drip. And then yeah. you don't even know it sometimes. And, you, and then in another drip, you look back on the floor and you see like a drip three feet apart. That's drip, right. Something like that. Something you always notice It's not later. like a squirt. <laughs> it's not like a, a bad cut where it's pouring. Yep. 
<clears throat> so I think that word confuses people when they say, you know, the experts say active bleeder. I do too. That's all that means. It doesn't mean the rate of blood <laughs> you know, or anything right. like that. So it just, when you sit back and think about it, you see the picture of how close that was. It makes sense. And then again, not even to get into the blood vial, because we all know that everybody is aware that that EDTA was not found. It was not from that blood vial. Everybody's going and got blood drawn. You see how they get the hole in the top. The nurse explained that. So yeah. that's not, and, and the defense dropped all that, by the way. They never told us that in making a murder. Right. The blood vial, they brought it up, and then they're like, yeah, the nurse testified, and that was it. They dropped it. They never mentioned yeah. it again. So then this went to, well, they must have got the blood out of the sink or something. Mm -hmm. But. Just a little side note, just to get the blood before somebody mentions the blood vial, because that's still that's yeah. been completely debunked by Kathleen Zellner herself. So this is not like that's uh, right. some conspiracy thing. So um, the point being is, you know, if I'm if I'm going to plant blood, and I've watched some shows, I've watched some you know uh, true crime stuff, whatever it may be. I'm going to put it in obvious places on the steering wheel, the gear shift. Yeah, all that rear kind of view stuff. Mirror. Rear view mirror, kind of like it was in his car, very near mm -hmm. the gear shift. But they didn't show you that in making a murder. They didn't even show no. his car, um, and, and and certainly didn't the, about the part where he bled in it and admitted it. So <laughs> no. it's it's very odd. That you know, again, it's just it's just on our parts guesstimations and just you know a little just a little uh, back and forth about possibilities we, we'll never know but it's certainly more possible that you know just as likely as somebody going and getting some kind of you know vial of, of liquid blood yeah and putting drips different ways and swabs over here and doing it all different ways right now i am speaking to people who have watched making a murderer but have yet to for one reason or another watch convicting a murderer yeah but are listening to us talk about it okay i'm speaking to you <laughs> uh-oh i was just like you 100 percent. i was duped i really hated the cops believed steven was wrongfully imprisoned wrongfully convicted or at least the jury was tainted the that, jury pool totally yep. yeah because 100%. of that interview i mean the uh the press conference yep crap it was either a tainted jury pool or they were just idiots or the wrong evidence guy i don't know but i totally believed everything in making a murderer it was Yelling at the TV sometimes. Yeah. Like, oh my God, I can't believe you mother effers were Are doing that. Are you fucking that. kidding yeah. me? You know, it is just ridiculous. And I really, I bought how pitiful his mom was, his dad was. Yeah. You know, they were. And uh, there are some things in this that surprise me about both of them. Sure. I'm not saying they're bad people or anything. Just surprising is all I'm saying. Yeah. But. But I'm I'm speaking to you people who are like, my mind's made up. There's a frame job. Whether the cops framed him or the real killer framed him, whatever. Watch this. Please watch this thing. It will blow your mind. Yeah. And don't watch it with that attitude like we almost had. Like there's nothing you can say that's gonna change my mind. Right. Just watch it. Open minded. I'm telling yes. you. Yes. There's and so much stuff. I don't know if you said this on take one or you said it earlier in this take, but can't wait to see what Kathleen Zellner says. Please, please address it because, you know, she did all the testing and all that stuff. And, you know, we still believe the splatter all of a sudden on the back of the hatch and all that mm -hmm. stuff. It did not get there by throwing somebody into the car. It was probably slung off something. Yes. So we, we're not, we definitely still believe that it happened differently the way they presented it. We're not yeah. saying it's exactly like that because stuff still don't make sense with that. But it's just showcasing what they cut out of this thing and, and made him and, and cut out a lot of phone conversations with yeah. his parents for that matter. He literally says yeah. to his dad something about the gun and you know, he's a felon. And the gun did belong to the trailer owner, right? Which we didn't know about either, right? Um, and he said, "I wiped it off." And then his dad said, "Huh?" or something like that. And he's like, "I'm on TV." 
I'm on TV and just kind of immediately change the subject. Yes. Like, why would you say you wiped it off? And it's not the only time on there they show that he says something and almost realizes he said it and like, oh, yeah, these calls are recorded. I forgot for a second. Exactly. There's a few of those moments. Yeah, he's talking about the 22, and he's telling on another call, he says, well, it's just a 22. I mean, it's not going to kill somebody. I mean, you, I mean, kill you could kill somebody. I mean, you, some something with it. Right. But it's a twenty two. It ain't gonna know? do nothing. Yeah, it ain't <laughs> gonna do nothing. But he sure he catches himself twice on there. Right. And there's things, God, I want to. I can't mention. And obviously, we can't spoil anything past episode seven. But I know. I can't wait to be able to talk about that as well. But anyway, and, you know, then he went to really quick the blood from the sink, and that's damn near impossible. He, he believes that, you know, well, they got in my trailer and I bled that night because I busted that cut open. It was in the sink, but I didn't clean up. Then I went to the store. So somebody was waiting right by your house to go in there and grab blood while still liquid or not, you know, coagulated. Everywhere. Right. Scooped it all up into something and then ran to the car, which had to be very close by and did the drips and did the rubbing and all that stuff and then locked it and took the key. And, yeah. It's really, when you start thinking that way, uh, logically, it's it's really hard to believe that you have to have a source of that blood. And again, that whole blood vial was ruled out way early. Even the pro, even the defense ruled that out. And so, honestly. I mean, it's just common it, sense. If it's Stephen Avery's dirty sink where this blood was supposed to be, yeah, don't you think that Jody's... DNA may show up in that blood sample <laughs> from brushing her teeth in that sink. And you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no telling what I, I don't know. Uh, particles of toothpaste. Yeah, or I don't know. I mean, it was. I mean, why Stephen is Avery is not a guy who's cleaning up every day, but yeah. he's got carpet cleaners and vacuums and shit. Now, again, you did mention, you know, Judy was going to be getting out or something. I don't remember when exactly, but she was still in jail that night. But she had been there. She had, li- you know, stayed mm-hmm. with him. So maybe. You know, clean, she was cleaning or whatever, and they had conversations about the rug doctor having problems with it. I might take it back. And then they found, you know, there was a brand new in there. They didn't find anything inside the rug doctor. Uh, a, lot, a lot of little things like that. It's like Stephen Avery's not a guy that cleans up right. a, a lot. Right. He may throw some junk every once in a while in a fire uh, and burn it up or burn trash, but his, his, you know, you can't look at that house and think he's like a clean dude. Mm. You, you, like he's a neat freak. I mean, come on. I mean, the logistics of all these things, <clears throat> man. Like he said, somebody would have to say, "Oh, it looks like he's going to Menards. He's about to leave the house to go to yeah. Menards." He leaves, run in there really fast because how much time would you have to get fresh blood out of a sink? Now I do know that Kathleen Zellner is entertaining the sink theory because she went yeah. and took the sink out. Yeah. So maybe she has blood experts. I think she has Bobby going in there, <clears throat> you know? Bobby and, um, yeah. And so, but to me, like you said, they'd have to be hiding outside. They leave. They'd have they to know he go was in bleeding. There. Yeah, it, you, yeah. What are you looking for in there? You have to know, go straight to the blood yeah, I mean, in the you bathroom think, you sink. You think that he's keeping a vial of his own blood in the fridge or something? I don't get you know? it. And again, you that know? goes back to the EDTA stuff. It has to be in something that keeps blood from coagulating. Did it's they, just weird. Did they go in there looking for anything, see the blood, and go, oh, this would be great. Now they got to get, how do they get the blood, scrape it up out of yeah, there? Right. Out of the sink. They come prepared with gloves and uh, some kind of special weird container to suck it up in. And I don't know. It's it's very odd when you start really thinking about it. Do they get Stephen hammered? He passes out, and they're over there milking his finger down. Oh yeah, right, exactly. I mean, that would be (laughs) that would be more logical than a sink. I agree. Like a really slip him a roofie, and then just yeah, you can get blood, but you have to have an active source. Yeah, and that's the problem with the theories is that. Once that blood vial is ruled out because, you know, clearly it was opened by his previous lawyers and the nurse talked about the hole because that's how they get the blood in it, not out of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, once that's ruled out, there's you got to have blood. You got to. And, there's, and it's got to be liquid enough liquid to where it can't be watered down, dried up blood that you've shook up in something and mm-hmm. dripped everywhere. 
because that's going to look like watered down blood. Yeah. These blood blood experts, they know what they're looking at. Yeah. And that's what that's they did do that. They made like the 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 states people look like idiots, and then Kathleen Zellner's were experts, you know, like yeah. the real experts or something. And once you go back through it, it's like no, and you you think about it that way. It, what they're saying makes sense. It's not that hard, as far as like you know, just, you just need blood. You got to have blood for to get blood in a car. Yeah. And his own car had the same shit in it in the same way, and they never mentioned that. And I look at Stephen as, you know, this sad figure who's lost 18 years of his life, just like everybody else, man. But I cannot come up with any logical explanation of why he is not the killer because of that blood. Right. I'm telling you, I can... I think I can explain away in my mind or, you know, can at least argue uh, all the other things, but that, because let's say he did not kill her, but he knows who did and he's helping them get rid of the car. That's just as bad. Yeah, it is. So, I mean, he's where he belongs. Exactly. hundred percent. But he bled in that car. He did. There's just no, there's no if ands, buts about it anymore. No. Like I said, once the blood vial is gone, which is a, a clear, easy source of blood, which you can, you can drip and dab it and have whatever you want. Once that's gone out of the picture, which again the defense dropped in the trial, they just didn't pursue it anymore. You don't have anything left. Because I'm telling you right now, if they drew blood from him in jail, in yeah. prison. First off, Stephen Avery's not going to let anybody draw blood and don't have a warrant. Mm-hmm. Secondly, it would be documented. He would be able to clearly say they yes. drew blood from me on this day, this day, this day, and they might have went out there and done that. And all he said was they did the first time, which, again, that, that's the vial. But that's, yeah, that's it's got the, the EDTA in it. Yep, that's the vial. So it's got to be this time when he was locked up for having the firearm by a felon. Right. They would have had to have taken blood then. So in run those- out. Three Put days, I think it was. Yeah, right? so he think got about that. For the firearm, three or four, five days later, it was charged. With, it was charged with murder. He bled in there. He, he, he bled in that car. I'm sorry, and I know it breaks a lot of people's hearts. It broke my own. Yeah, really. I mean, again, maybe not exactly. It didn't happen the way they presented exactly, but he had he had to have. Um, and real quick before we get out of here, we we've got to talk about Brandon episode seven. So episode seven really focuses on Brandon because mm. this is always the big caveat, right? Stephen may have done it, but Brandon, he just he is. And then again, I do have empathy for the kid. Yeah, he's a poor kid. Um, he got roped into this, and he's covering for his uncle. And I I believe that to some degree, but they didn't also play all of that. Now let me just say up front the confession part where he's you know. Clearly guessing, yeah, about uh, no uh, doubt a cutter, and they're like, cut what her hair, and they're like, hair, yeah. <laughs> what happened to her head? He uh, punched her. Uh, yeah, he punched. <laughs> I mean, clearly. And then, of course, the federal courts agreed yeah. habeas corpus, and then that was upheld, and then turn overturned in the in the Supreme. But as far as being involved, he knew some things. He actually put this on himself. Come to find out, so. The first time they spoke to him was in a car when he was riding with his brother, not Bobby, but the other brother, uh, I believe. And, um, you know, they're asking him questions, and he says, I believe, something to the effect of they're asking about Teresa. Did you see her taking a picture? I can't remember, all that kind of stuff. And then he says, you think he did it? Well, (laughs) again, my note here says November 6th. It was their first interview with Brendan. Yeah, yeah. He mentions rape. He says, you think he did it, and the cop says, think he did what? You think he raped her? That's a week, uh, not even a week after the damn thing. Nobody had mentioned anybody. Nobody knew about any raping or anything at that point. So, you know, he said it. It's on tape. (laughs) You You can hear him say it. So... Here's my th- my thing about about Brendan that everybody knows that's watched it. He's all over the place. He really is. He is. I mean, it's pitiful. 
I have I have I still have trouble with with Brendan and Chris yeah. will tell you I I just I I will say a lot of this docu series puts a lot of weight on Brendan and I think the reason yeah. they do is because we all know that Stephen wouldn't be where he's at or wouldn't have been then without Brendan. Yeah. They needed without that uh, confession. They needed that for sure. Yeah. And that gives, you know, credence to the whole we gotta find somebody to, mm -hmm. to set up here. Of course. And uh I feel like he got a bum rap and everything, but he <laughs> okay, so Teresa goes miss, missing on Halloween. Brendan and um Steven have a bonfire. I don't think anybody would argue those on either side. Yeah. She goes missing the same day they had a bonfire. Okay. On the 6th, they interview him. He mentions the word rape. Do you think he did it? What, <laughs> what do you mean? He did what? Do you think he raped her? Yep. We and Chris were like, how did they <laughs> not dig into that deeper That's... on November the 6th? He just said that. Well, guess what? On February the 20th, they talked to his cousin, Kayla. I think that's her name, right? Kayla, correct. Okay. Yep. She says, you might want to look talk to my cousin, Brendan. He's lost a lot of weight. He's crying all the time. He's staring off into space. And just to throw this in there, the uh -huh. specific question, I think, that made her say that was, has he ever, has Stephen ever touched you in any odd ways that you're uncomfortable with or something to that effect? And then, then I believe she said, you need to talk to my cousin, Brendan. Ooh. Does he mention that to Barb, I think, at one point? So. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, he he does. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, now, we said on 11-6, they interview him the first time. 2-20, they interview Kayla. She says, look at my cousin, Brendan. A yeah. week later, on the 27th of February, they had their second interview with him at school. That's cool. He yeah. says he saw a body. It's the first time he says that. They're like, wait a minute, we need to get him to a better spot. So they, on that same day, call Barb, get her to come down there. They go over to this place called Two Rivers. A small police department. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> after that, he says enough to where they're like, okay, we need to talk more. We're going to put you up in this resort. They kind of want to keep them away from... Well, they know he's implicating Steven, and they yeah. don't know what's up. So that he could be in danger, or maybe they just want to keep him away from the influence of family members, whatever the right. case may be. So four days later, on March 1st, is that infamous interview where he's sitting there and uh, he confesses. Now, to me, that's sloppy on the police's part. I just yep. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Cause you said the losing weight doesn't mean a thing. Mm -mm. You talking about they made it like you? It's not normal for a kid to lose weight. Well, you're talking about four months, not two weeks. Right. He could have lost weight because he's trying. Mm -hmm. He could have been turned down by a girl or bullied at school. Yeah, somebody called him fatty. You never There's, know. Depression can come in many yeah. forms for a young kid, especially one like like him with a low IQ, all that stuff, I'm, I'm assuming. Right. And the, you can't just say, we went over there to check on him. Cops don't go check on kids because they're losing weight. No. But they went because they think he's he knows something, and that's – what I mean in the first, in the interview at school, in which what which is what made him when he that's the first time he admitted knowing anything like I saw things. Yeah. Then they go record him at the police station to get it on camera, even though they had the audio before, but they wanted it on camera. He basically gave him the same information, but he when they directly asked him right at that time, uh, did you have anything to do with her dead parents? No. Did you do anything to her? No. It was all no's, and mm -hmm. that was bit, pretty much okay. He's a witness now. He's saying you know, he saw these things at Stephen's house. Now, yeah. here's the devil's advocate part. I still feel like they were feeding him stuff, even on the 27th. Because remember, I looked at you. Yeah. On the 27th, Weigert said, did you stab her? Yes. that's. And I'm like, man, 
that's leading this guy. It, it really, to me, it is. And because where did they get an idea that she was stabbed at that point? Exactly. They had a little piece of her skull with a, a bullet hole in it. Like, what are they? You know, Stephen ain't saying anything about somebody stabbing. No, he, yeah, he's, you know, he's, in, he's so in jail already. Where and... do they come up with this? They're feeding that. And then on the first, they get him to confess to stabbing her and asking him how deep and all that. That right. was the first time, about, too. About that much. Yeah. 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 Cut her throat about that deep. Stabbed her in the stomach about that deep. Mm -hmm. Stephen did. Um, I don't know, man. I, I still have a hard time with Brandon. I do too. And and like I said, at this point, and again, until we see um, you know, the finale and, and any more information or whatever, you know, I feel like at this point with what we've seen through episodes nine, <laughs> which we, we mm. can't we can't spoil because there's some things here that they did not put in making a murder that it clearly knows something. Is this further than we can talk about? Yes, that's, okay. <laughs> that's why I can't I, I want to say it right <laughs> okay. now. All right. But at this point, um, again, you just mentioned all the, the confessions. I still do not believe um, that the actual confession was real. I don't believe it at all. He was clearly led. Um, he was guessing. You yeah, can guess. tell the parts where he's recalling and the, and the parts where he's getting. And you don't have to. I mean, look, I'm not an expert. But I don't think you have to be an expert to see no, that. No, no. But I, here, at this point with Brendan... Um, because, like you said, the confession was after it kind of just escalated from nothing. But he did implicate himself, and I did question that too. Like you said, if the if the cops, the the other investigator from Calumet County, heard him say, "Do you think he raped her?" I'm not sure why that wasn't immediately. Yeah. Why Why they wasn't on him then? That's it's so months wild. and months later that they go back to him. Yeah. But they needed somebody to. Uh, but I guess that's what made them think, okay, he's the guy out of all these people we're interviewing in the family that's covering for somebody. Yeah. I yeah. believe. Now, Chris and I both, I think it was you that really perked up on this. Brendan says something that it just really threw me. Oh, no, it wasn't Brendan. It was a guy recalling Brendan saying this. Yeah, yeah. All right, so... You tell me, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but the way I understand it is Teresa was at Stephen's place taking the pictures and supposedly her car was there. Like she was there. Her car was there at least when Brendan got home from school on the bus. Yeah. This was during you know, his interview. So she was already there, supposedly, right? She must have been in the bedroom Steven and her hanky panky and whatever <laughs> in the bedroom when Brendan's bus pulls up. This cop, a detective, or somebody is saying Brendan first denied that she was that he saw her there. Right. And then he says, Oh yeah, I did see her. Matter of fact, me and my brother had to move out of the way so she could pass. So she could pass us. Yep. That's weird to me because it definitely wasn't when she was coming. No, if that because that happened, was too late. That was too late by the yeah. by the uh, booking of the appointments, you know, and the voicemail and all that stuff is like two thirty. If they had to move out of the way, him and his brother, for her to get by, she, she would have been leaving. Yeah, but that's the only time that's said, to my knowledge. Yeah, it's the only time that's said, to my knowledge. And if he said it, like I said, it was that guy saying he said that. Yeah. So I haven't seen it. Yeah, um, I, haven't heard, I didn't hear that. But uh, if, Wait a minute, did they play? They may have played that. Yeah, uh, If they did. I believe they played that audio, yeah. I believe they did, actually. And, and you know, the way we've talked about how his story is all over the place, why didn't that, why does that not matter? But all right. the other stuff does. You know, some don't, <laughs> some does, you know, some do. And uh, I don't know. I just that was odd, and, no, and I'll entertain it more. Yeah, but you know that was tonight. I, I believe they did play that audio though of him saying, "Yeah, we, me and my brother had to step out of the way for her to pass." Because I remember the words. Pass. Oh, okay, yeah, I believe they okay. did play the audio. 
But so, um, that's that, awfully... so that was very odd. And it's just, it just he, like, like you said, he's all over the place. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, he has this confession. Then he says, no, uh, they got my head. And then he tells his mom again that he did it on the phone after they threatened to yeah. call her mom, like he's still getting in trouble with his mom. And then, you know, he then he changed it again to I made it up. I, I, re- I got it all out of a book. Yeah. So with um, – with the Brendan situation at this point, this is where I'm at. I think that the confession in the school, I mean, I'm sorry, in the police station, Two Rivers, was about as close to the truth as we're ever going to know. Where he did go over there and, and saw something. Maybe he saw her in the fire because he said he saw it changed from toes to belly to forehead, and he had these weird reasons why he thought it was those parts. Yeah, I and thought I, you so, know, too. It feels morbid talking about it like that, but that's I agree. The way, I agree. the way he's wording it. And But then, you know, they asked him all those direct questions. Were you involved? Did you do this? No, 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 no. Straight notes. Three or four days later, he got, they got the confession. I think that, and we'll have more evidence to substantiate this when we can talk about it, I think that that's probably closer to the truth right now is where I'm at, that he saw something. At the most, he he's some kind of accomplice to maybe hiding the car because he knew details about that or maybe maybe throwing some stuff on the fire. I don't believe he was in that trailer. I'll say this. Or at least did anything in that trailer to her. I don't think I he agree. physically could. I, I don't either. The way he described it. What I believe is they interviewed him on the 6th of November. Yep. And what happens? He goes home. They interview him on the 27th. He says he saw a body. And this was February. Yes, yep. of 20 uh mm-hmm. February 27th. He saw a body. Now what happens? They call his mom and say, "Hey, we're going to go talk down here at this other place." So he goes down there. Tells them some more really damning things. But bad enough, you know, they, they're like, we don't want to talk to him again, but we don't want him to go home. But right. they put him in this, him and his mom in this resort. So in Brendan's mind, he has said some things that are pretty bad. The cops not only let him go home, they, they put him, him and his mom in a resort. I told Chris, I said, right. I think he believes they're kind of his friends oh, yeah. on his side. He can say anything at this point. Yep. And he's going to get to go home. And he's going to go get to watch wrestling. Yeah. He's going to, he's got, you know, he's, so, I need to go back to class. I got a, a report doing six period, you know, all those type of things. And they're hammering him. They're a hundred percent doing, using that tactic. I mean, yeah. they are there. Hey, you look, you're doing the right thing. It's okay to say those words here. Those type of things. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And I just, uh, I feel like he told them, what he thought they wanted to hear. That's why he was guessing. Yep. That's why he was I, guessing. I, I, yeah. There's nothing I've seen so far in convicting a murderer that me, leads me to believe that his confession is in any way real as far as the de- the grisly details of guessing about what he's cutting and hitting, punching, and all that kind of stuff. It, it doesn't yeah. make sense. But I do believe, again, now, based off the other things that we'll get to eventually, mm-hmm. that there was it, he saw something. He was in, involved in a smaller way, and uh, he was covering for Stephen. Because um, it's it, you know it's just it's hard to say that this guy. You know, I saw other videos too. I saw um, a video on the way home the other night. Um, Candace Owens and Matt Walsh talking about it, and they're so hardcore that he's just an evil little young Michael Myers. No and way. that's not, that's the other extreme. You, you can't, you can't have sympathy for an evil. No, look, there's, you can have sympathy for somebody that's done something bad. Yeah. Uh, I don't, absolutely. I don't buy the extreme on either side of that argument. So uh, that's, that's just where I'm at right now. As far as Brendan goes, um, that, you know, based off the stuff that we didn't hear making a murderer, that he knew something but he didn't. I don't think he participated. I don't think he was no. physically able to in that situation. I don't think so either. I'm not. We'll get to the grisly details there. Yeah. You kind of know what we're talking but about. But everybody put yourself in his shoes. Yeah. I mean, exactly. he's a virgin. And yeah. supposedly, just by his uncle egging him on with while he's some, watching. Yeah. He's yeah. watching. Yeah. Telling him what to do. While this lady, we can only assume, like Ken Kratz said in that press conference it's probably 
you know, yeah. crying for her life. Yeah, and that you can't you can't have that. It was two stories there. I don't think he and could do that. I don't either. So that's I know, and you know, Brendan's always the hard part because he you feel more sorry for him than you do Stephen Avery because I he's agree. such a young kid and and, mm-hmm. and and you know low IQ the whole thing. So it, it's tough, man. And I, I think like everything in that we hear about on the news or whether it's a true crime story or not, the truth lies somewhere in the middle, and that's kind of where I'm leaning with what we're seeing here. Yeah. Um. I mean, look, believe me, I still think that the press conference was bullshit that Ken Kratz did the it way was. he did it. He says it himself. It was yeah. a mistake. He should have just given out press things. Um, but you tainted the jury pool. He was never getting a fair trial. There's no way. But his defense wanted to keep him there because they knew about his mm-hmm. other story. So that was supposed to be helping them. So they were bad on his defense too. But, but I still call think, bullshit on that, and he's never going to get a fair trial. Do you think that's a slick lawyer thing to <clears throat> do the press conference saying – well, I'll say it was a mistake later. Yeah, hundred percent. I do too. Yeah, yeah. I, he, look, I don't think he's a great person now. All of a sudden, I don't. I think right. Ken Kratz is still a, a cocksucker. I mean, to put it bluntly, he says it himself about in the, some interviews I've seen. Other, not this documentary, but look, I was an arrogant bastard back then. I was on pills, and he did. You know, of course, he yeah. had the sexting scandal and all that stuff. Yeah. So he actually admits some of that too. Mm. And then. The last thing I'll mention real quick, it, it, you know, the bullet. You know, the bullet was found, and Sherry, I think, Colhane was the girl who was the, the um, forensic uh, who, who tested the bullet with yeah. her DNA. They found the 122 round. They did edit some testimony there about how he said they found a bullet versus a fragment. Yeah. But she did admit to contaminating the control of that. So she had to wash the bullet off. There wasn't enough. And you made a great point. How does she know that? Well, I mean, I guess a microscope, but I don't, we don't, we don't know, but she washed off all that to a vial to get more as much as possible. Mm -hmm. It was her DNA Teresa's, but then in the control, she accidentally contaminated it with her own DNA because she said she was teaching some students and she was sitting at this, this table, this workbench and probably a little spittle Mm -hmm. (laughs) got into the test tube. But they did make it clear that she admitted it. There was she didn't have to admit that. They no. didn't have to. They could have said, "Yep, it's Teresa's blood." They brought up a good point too that she's actually the one that got she, Stephen Avery out of prison. She, she's the same one. Yeah, she's the same one that actually tested got him the, exonerated, tested the thing, and yeah. in uh, Allen's uh, hair. Yeah, so, so she's she, not like you know unbiased or right. Something. And and you know I still. I question the whole deal of washing the bullet. I do yeah. because I know in season two of making a murder, Kathleen Zellner gets that bullet and that's where she's able to see the pink coloration on the bullet. Right. And she throws out that it could be chapstick or whatever. And that's how they got the DNA on there. So, right. you know, I just, I don't feel like that if that lady looked at it under a microscope, she could have made come to the conclusion that yeah. there was there's not enough on there's there to be tested multiple times. So I'm gonna get <laughs> off all I can. Right. It's just convenient. And that's it, what I told Chris. I said there's a lot of the convenient things that happen on the side of the prosecution that you just have to kind of deal with. Yeah, there there is. There certainly is. And and I, in a couple of other videos I was watching, there's there mentioning, you know, every single case has these little mistakes. They call them paper trail mistakes, or not paper trail mistakes, but paper mistakes or something to that effect. There's always little things that cops do that could have been done better, and and they were you know not procedural or they made a m- mistake, and that's fine. Uh, and you that's, can criticize that, and you should. They should that's be. Why you have a judge and jury? That's exactly right. But it doesn't take away from other things. It doesn't mean the other stuff's all wrong, because she accidentally spit right. in the control uh, vial does not mean that that was not Teresa's DNA. It, it just doesn't. Now. Again, you can question the method. Hey, by the way, if somebody's a forensic anthropologist and you know how to that works, let us know. And you know, I mean, because mm-hmm. we don't know how what that means. Whether there has to be enough to test, but what? How does she know that? How does she come to that conclusion to wash it off? Because it can never be tested again. No. Nope. And that uh, that ends up being a crucial part of this murder weapon, where her blood or DNA, they say DNA was on it. And you're assuming blood, right? Because they supposedly cleaned up the garage, but we'll see. But uh, it's it's really just a crazy, crazy case, roller coaster ride, um, and uh, again, just 
go ahead. I was just to say, if this what we've said I, I, now doesn't make you scratch your head, I know. just keep watching. I know. Because we've seen past what you've seen. Stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely insane. It's it's kind of a emotional roller coaster too, because it brings you back. And you know, again, I I feel for her family. This is coming out, coming back up again. Everybody's, you know, all the uh armchair quarterbacks yeah. are back at it and the keyboard warriors and people like us talking about it on podcasts and mm-hmm. you're reliving all that stuff. But I mean, people need to see the other side of this. I think it's important. So I don't give a shit who put the documentary out daily wire, Netflix. It doesn't matter if you're interested in this case, just watch the damn thing. Yes. Um, I mean, if you want the full story, uh, you know, cause most of us are not, we're case enthusiasts where we talk about it maybe on a podcast and then we kind of forget about it. We look at a few videos and we're kind of done with it. But there's a handful of people that may have went crazy and studied every single aspect. I think like producer Brenda. Wow. Yeah. You know, got every little thing from every every file. I mean, few people like that. But you don't know the full story just because you think you know the full story. No. You just don't. No. And <laughs> so. and uh, be honest. Yeah. You exactly. know. You know that most of what you know came from making a murder season yeah, one 100%. and season two. hundred percent. If you're honest. Yeah. Now, I mean, like you said, there's small handful, small very handful, small yeah. handful, yeah. but the comments on every video I've watched or our own video is not a small, I mean, like, there's a ton of people who are like yeah. <laughs> savants when it comes to this, they think, I'm telling you. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there, there's a, a handful of, yeah, this has changed my mind. I think he's guilty, or I always knew he was guilty. There's definitely some of those, mm-hmm. but the majority of, and not just our video, but all the ones I've watched. Me is, too. I no, like to read this comments. doesn't change anything. I knew all this stuff. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't know all this stuff. No way. You didn't know how they edited it because you would have to be their friends and be part of their process to know how they edited. That's it. right. You just can't. And yeah, again. You could go get all the records and whatever, and, and the whole entire transcript of the whole trial. You can't, you can't know all that stuff from reading thousands, thousands, thousands of pages no. uh, on paper in this and, and have a life knowledge and, and, and have a life. Exactly. Yeah, and you're not gonna hear Colburn's side. No, you're not no. gonna hear the voice message, voicemail messages he plays. And you're on not here. gonna be watching like the documentary and reading the transcripts of the trial and then putting them side by side and realizing they took this whole chunk of information out. Right. You can't, you're not going to do that. No, you're not. That's right. You know, so it doesn't matter if you have the full case file, you can't, you're not going to be comparing those to know, okay, Oh, they, Oh shit. They conveniently left out that whole paragraph of Colburn saying this or answering that or whatever it may be. Yeah. So did you know that they used, that uh, one shot of him three times. Yeah, where he's you can't not even know that because that's not in the case file. Right. So those things is what we're talking about. You know, it's not just the the evidence and the case and all that. That you know, the legal stuff. It's the it's the editing. It's the 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 producing and all that good stuff as far as the documentary itself. It's things that matter, and they do matter. And yeah, because that's what gives you. That's what pulls on your heartstrings and makes you think one way or the other. So that's all we're doing. We're trying to present both sides. Um, and you know, again, there's still shit the cops fucked up on for sure. Yeah. Um, there's, I still uh, have, like you said, trouble with Brendan, but, um, yeah, yeah. We're just trying to just, you know, just tell both sides of the story and just have a conversation. So that's right. And just stay tuned, mm-hmm. stay Definitely. tuned to us as well. Cause we'll keep talking and, uh, we'll keep thinking, you know, this is something yeah. you have to digest. You do. It takes time. <laughs> To like really said, step back from it. You've already watched them a couple of times. I will too, because there's things that you got to think about. And like, let me go back and see that thing again. I actually, a matter of fact, I can I can say this much. Uh, after what I watched last night, when I watched the uh, episodes eight and nine, mm-hmm. I was sitting there going, "Those bastards! <laughs> Those bastards need to rot in prison." But then I told Chris, yeah. I said, I had this mindset. Okay, fool me once, shame on me. Right. Fool me twice. No, fool me once, shame on you. <laughs> fool me. I am. I'm George Bush in yeah. it over here. <laughs> no, won't be fooled again. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my God. Okay, let me. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I said, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. What yes. I meant was, 
I came away from making a murderer so freaking mad. Same. And then I come away from convicting a murderer feeling the same feelings. Yeah. And so, oh, yeah. I need to step back for a minute and digest this. So yeah. try to do that as well. Yes, it's because again, it's the same thing. You can you can all of a sudden switch, and you know you're being kind of pulled this direction, and you're ignoring anything they said in making a murder, which that's not what we're saying either. Right. You know, just both sides of the story. Just so. Both sides, and just be open minded. Yeah, and, and breathe. It's crazy, man. <laughs> it's a wild ride. <laughs> and breathe, it is. But anyway, that's basically wraps up episode six and seven. And uh, again. Uh, stay tuned, man. We got something cool coming, and then we'll definitely be talking about you know the rest of the episodes when we can. And I think uh, I think that's good. Anything else? I'm sure we're going to think of something. I can't after believe we I George Bush that. Yeah. That was... <laughs> well, that's all right. We have to have some funny moments yeah, in an otherwise that's right. podcast. That's right. <laughs> Especially after losing the first thirty minutes the first time. <laughs> yeah. I think we I think we covered it all again. Though. We just filmed one and a half podcasts. We did. We <laughs> this fucking old file is corrupt. <laughs> Jesus, but. Anything else? I think no, we're good. I feel good about. I'm that. sure there'll be some little thing we forgot to mention or whatever. We'll go. Oh damn! But I'm sure we'll hear it in the comments. But yeah, let us know what you think. Yeah, and, you know, um, has have you watched it? Uh, have you changed your mind at all? Is it you know at least giving you at least a little retrospective of how this whole thing was put together and yeah. the legal system in general? You know, and then conspiracies. You know, you have to have all these people involved and everybody's got to. Right. You know, have the same goal and work together and not get caught. And it's uh, it's just a crazy roller coaster ride. But again, uh, just remember Teresa Holback. Just you know, she she actually got killed during this. Yeah, that's right. You know, we're all we're all um, you know kind of profiting from this story in some way. Yeah, but I think when this is all said and done, they ought to let Stephen Avery and Joe Exotic fist fight. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> the, the, whoever wins gets dead. out. <laughs> Oh, she so gets say, okay. I was gonna say to the death, but that's gonna be the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, there pretty you much. Go. That'd be cool. That's right. That would be entertaining. That would be pay per view that people would watch. <laughs> it would. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So stay tuned. We'll be back um, next week with something very special, and then we'll continue the very. week after that as well with the other episodes. So um, I guess we'll let it go. And uh, thanks for watching. And let it fade to black. Oh, my voice is cracking.